Hello and welcome to the Volunteering Safeguarding course from Warrington Voluntary Action. My name is Brian and I'm going to guide you through the session today. Now this short film is a recorded version of what would be normally a longer course. So I'm not going into a great depth or detail what i'm going to ask you to do is seek support from your volunteer manager as to the information that you specifically need to do the role that you're doing so this is very much an overview it's a bit of a whistle stop tour but it's just to give you a generalized awareness of the current climate and culture around safeguarding we're going to look at a brief element of the legislation and how the rules and guidelines look at safeguarding and then move into your current and existing practices and some things to think about finalizing in how you would record report or pass on any concern that you might have there is more information on the links below the video and as i say by all means seek the support of your volunteer manager or the team at WVA for more information. So let's get started. We might as well start at the beginning and with a big open question of what is safeguarding? Safeguarding's evolved considerably over the last few years as we've learned new things about society, new things about communities and ways in which we can support people and their their viewpoint and position in the world if you ask many people or when i talk to people in my sessions and i ask them what safeguarding was lots of people would come back with child protection it's much more than child protection and that absolutely includes the adult world as well as the children and young people world it also takes into account safeguarding yourself and a big shift that we've taken in understanding safeguarding and protecting people is that you the practitioner need to be protected too because if you're not safe then there's nobody there to do the caring so safeguarding takes into account loan working it takes into account elements of health and safety it's a all-encompassing concept that is there to try and reduce harm to as many people as possible and to stop harm that may be happening to anybody the question of why we need to think about it should hopefully have an obvious answer in that because we care and we don't want people to come to harm why we think about it as volunteers and as a community sector has a slightly different lean to it than the obligations and um, role that let's see the public sector or a, a police officer a medical person um, a gp may play in this situation one of the arguments made about the community sector and volunteers in general is that they come with a different level of trust a lot of people have barriers and suspicions of people with lanyards and name badges and official positions to put it bluntly a lot of people are scared of the police a lot of people are scared of medical personnel especially people in challenging circumstances or have chaotic lives they might think their circumstance might change somebody might take my kids away somebody might lock me up there's lots of fear and challenges and paranoia within people we play a different role we are there to be support we are there to be friendly so when we think about why we think about it what we are is the place where people drop their guard the role we play is that of a friendly connection and i often use the phrase when i try and encourage people to think about how to frame it you're being friendly without being their friend because being their friend is a much deeper connection but being friendly is about being open it's about accepting them as who they are what their journey is what their situation is and allowing them to be 
the best they best person they could be so the role we play is one of open acceptance it's one where people can truly feel that they can be themselves it's also one where people feel they can tell their truth and that truth means that we are party to some of their darkness it also means that we're party to all of the complexity of their lives which puts us the the practitioner the volunteer in a in a challenging position because we are then pulled into that world so the role we play is an important one about being a supporter about being a trusted individual and having that power and responsibility to pass that information on to people that could really do something about it the role we play is of communicator we're not there to fix we're not there to solve the problems we're not there to sweep in and change their lives our life-changing act will be by passing the information on so when we think about safeguarding we're thinking about this friendly open accessible community role that we're playing which means that we are potentially likely to hear or see some of the things that are happening to people that are causing them harm so it's with that thought that we follow through the rest of the course historically safeguarding dealt with concepts of vulnerability now there were groups of vulnerable people and when i work with organizations I get this statement a lot that we have vulnerable people and it comes with a big panic usually more exclamation marks if we think about actually who is vulnerable and why and when then the old ideas of vulnerable groups doesn't really work anymore and in reality everyone is vulnerable because if we consider those people who we thought were vulnerable originally older people younger people people with physical disabilities learning difficulties mental health challenges not everyone that fits into that group is vulnerable it's also ignoring a whole bunch of other people who are vulnerable but just don't happen to fit into those categories not every older person is vulnerable in not every situation is a child vulnerable so in reworking this society legislation has had to look at this in a different way and vulnerable is now elastic it's now potentially fleeting it may now be for a very very short period in someone's day it's not their entire life and who they are so in rewriting that they've had to look at actually what does vulnerable mean and it's a series of characteristics and situations and this has come from many different places acknowledging certainly that those groups who were traditionally considered vulnerable aren't actually and that's been through a lot of campaigning and protest as well there's been a lot of awareness raising from groups of disabled people that have said just because i'm disabled doesn't mean i'm vulnerable just because I'm older doesn't mean I'm feeble so it's come from the communities themselves and it's also come from really looking to see who who is actually harmed and who has a higher likelihood of being harmed so when we think about this idea of harm we break it down into two different ways one side is about the person themselves these are personal internal characteristics often that somebody can't control or often that has evolved over time and those are situations and circumstances that mean that that person could be quite vulnerable when we mean vulnerable when we say vulnerable we mean open or likely to experience harm or abuse we call that person and we're going to look at adults but very similarly applies to children as an adult with care and support needs 
So essentially the individual, the new vulnerable if you like, is an adult with care and support needs. If you put that adult in a situation where they have all the support they need, all the care that they need, the right people around them with their best interest at heart, and they really truly act on those best interests, then that person isn't vulnerable because they've got all the support and the situation that they need around them to help them reach their potential and lead the best life they can. However, if we consider that there are these social and external factors that care, that support those other people that either doesn't have their best interest at heart or isn't able to have their best interest at heart, then the risk of them being harmed is considerably higher and they become an adult at risk. Now, these are two independent situations. You can absolutely be someone in need so you can have care and support needs you can also be at risk however you can't be considered someone who will be safeguarded unless you are both when we look at what they mean when we break them down into the next section you will hopefully see how these two things make sense but ultimately you can have care and support needs and be completely fine you could be at risk and be able to be resilient and strong enough to manage that. However, the situation around safeguarding means you have care and support needs and you are at risk, and that means you are at a higher likelihood of being harmed. So let's break those characteristics down and hopefully this will start to make sense. One of the things your organisation um, will probably have did already is identify a lot of this anyway. Unless you are a frontline volunteer who's maybe meeting people for the first time, or there's a lot of service users who are quite transient and are moving through your organisation, you don't need to assess them. You don't need to make this sort of judgment yourself. It's just for you to have an idea of what we now mean by vulnerable. So don't worry that you're meant to be here trying to identify this. It's really just so you can either put pieces together in your own mind about how somebody might be being harmed or just how somebody might just need a little bit extra support because of the challenges and circumstances they live with. So the list of factors, I'm not going to go through these in great depth because there's more information about them in the link below. But the personal side is a lack of mental capacity, communication difficulties, physical dependency, low self-esteem, a previous experience of abuse, rejecting help or displaying offensive or unusual aggressive behaviour. Now, if we look at this list, and even if you reflect on your own circumstance, this could be you at specific times. It's certainly me at some times. And it kind of illustrates how, if we look at vulnerability this way, it could be anybody. It could be an accident or an incident that injures you, that makes you vulnerable for a brief period of time, or sets you up as being vulnerable for a longer period of time or even for the rest of your life. You weren't vulnerable until that point and then you are. It could also be when you look at it as a list that actually there is only a brief period when somebody is, for example, physical dependency, when somebody is bathing you or dressing you, that you're vulnerable. But for the rest of the day, you're in no way vulnerable because you have that protective bubble around you. So this is a positive and a potentially highlighting negative thing because here we are, this list of things that makes that person potentially vulnerable. If they have all the care they need, everything works out well. However, take into account some social and external factors 
and suddenly the risk is considerably higher. So those external factors are being physically and financially dependent on others for care. Living in families with multiple problems, isolation and social exclusion and discrimination and being a target for crime. Now these are situations that either take advantage of that person with care and support needs or simply don't have the system in place or the resilience themselves to support that person. What this raises here, and I think it's an interesting point to raise because it comes up in a few other situations later, is that one could argue that not all safeguarding is about malicious intent to harm. Some safeguarding and support is about the the people who are trying to offer the care are really doing their best and with the best intention, but what they don't have is the resources or the knowledge or the capacity. People are trying their best but are not able to offer that person with care and support needs the support that they need. That's equally still a safeguarding issue because it's protecting both sides from harm. It's trying to support the carer and the person they're caring for. So in thinking about safeguarding in this much bigger holistic sense about reducing harm, it takes it away from about being about child protection or somebody doing something maliciously or as, as a criminal act. It's also about supporting those people who are really trying, but for whatever reason are, are not able to do what they're, they really want to do. So if we package all of these things together in both of those lists together, hopefully you will see that this puts a person considerably at risk and that this really increases the likelihood of harm. If you want a quick assessment for this, have a think about this statement and it's the idea that somebody has a lack of access to information and support. What we mean by this, if I break it down, is that what we generally need to achieve most things in life is information. We need to first work out how to find it and then when we do find it, we need to work out how to understand it. We need to possibly navigate our way through it, follow some instructions, possibly ask for some more help. If we have the ability to ask for more help and that help comes and it's suitable, then we can get to where we need to be. If someone struggles to find that support or that information, if when that support comes or that support around them is as struggling as they are, doesn't really have their best intention at heart, is actively looking to harm them, then there's a considerably high risk. And when I mean information, I mean day-to-day -day life choices, I mean the ability to choose care, the ability to choose daily things about what to eat, what to wear, whether to take your medication, what medication to take. So information and access to support is about everything in somebody's daily life. If somebody is challenged to do that and doesn't have the support around them, that's a very quick assessment to work out. They could be at risk. It doesn't mean they are, it just means they could be. We're going to talk more about risk as we go through the session, um, but that is a very quick universal summary of the idea of vulnerability. We've shifted from just saying every person who belongs to this category or this type of characteristic is vulnerable and now opens it up to anybody that's living with this series of challenges. There is lots of different legislation attached to this. Um, the Care Act has created a lot of this information. The Protections of Freedoms Act has also created a lot of the information around vulnerability as it shifted the ideas on who we screen and how we DBS. 
how we do that police check of somebody's background. One thing I do want to make you aware of, and you don't have to be completely up on all of this, is that there is lots of different documentation, lots of different pieces of paperwork and legislation that attaches into adult safeguarding and indeed child safeguarding. To say you don't need to be aware of all of this, I just want to make you know, just want to, sorry, make you aware that all of this is there. What this also raises, and the reason I'm putting this in, is because it means that there is almost, well, there is, in fact, a piece of paper for every situation. There's not one clear cut way of doing this. And it raises the point that every situation is unique. And yes, whilst somebody might be living with a specific type of abuse that we can define, the circumstance that got them there, the circumstance that will get them out the other end, the circumstance around dealing with it will have its own series of considerations and its potentially own mixture of legislation that it might use. So it might call upon different situations. So not only are we considering that each individual case of vulnerability or each individual case of care and support need is unique, we're also taking into account their situation is unique too. So it really takes us a step forward from where we may have been historically in just saying, oh, you're vulnerable, you need safeguarded, this is how we safeguard you. Where we are now is thinking about who are you, what do you need, what is happening in your world, and how can we support that? How do we support you to get to the best place you can possibly be and reach your potential? So there is a world of legislation and paperwork. As I say, you don't need to know all of this inside out and backwards. It's just to be aware there are lots of things involved in this world. I want to briefly talk about the, the, the split between adult and child safeguarding. I'm very aware that most people who are listening to this are going to be dealing with adults. However, I'm going to make the argument, and it's a pretty strong argument, all of these adults were once children. What I'm going to talk about here is how the considerations around child safeguarding and child protection are useful in thinking about the adults that you might meet now. So when we talk about the difference between adult and child safeguarding, and I would usually say to people, who is more complicated to safeguard? Quite a lot of the time people go down, people think children, and ultimately the opposite is true. And the reason behind that is because we give adults choice and autonomy. Adults can get themselves in many more complex situations than arguably children can. We have sort of mandated within our culture that somebody somewhere has to be responsible for a child. And when we mean child, for the purposes of this discussion around safeguarding, it's somebody up to the age of 18. If there is a specific situation where somebody has a learning difficulty or a disability, that age could be 19, it could be 21, it could be 25. So for the purposes of this, somebody somewhere is looking after somebody until they're roughly 25. After that time, we move into a very different world. You are essentially at 18, put into the world and given all your own choices, which means that there are lots of different situations and circumstances that could arise that could cause you harm or put you into a difficult situation. So adult safeguarding is immeasurably more complicated. It's also more complicated to deal with because there is perceived less urgency. I'm going to explain that. 
there is a much more softly, softly approach. Child safeguarding means that we have more power as uh, as agencies to support this, to be able to intervene quicker. Because adults have autonomy and ultimately choice, we can't sweep in and stop something happening. We have to have the adult choose to be removed from the situation. Whereas we don't give children as much choice in society. There are lots of moves towards listening to the voice of the child. And that voice of the child is what I would argue is the closest thing at the moment we have to the child having choice. Listening to their experiences and their viewpoints on things can help us gain whether they are comfortable with that situation and whether they should be there or not. It's a similar discussion that we would have with an adult. So adults and children are different because adults have choice and autonomy. Children have support, control, guardianship. Child safeguarding comes with a, an interesting term and it's usually always attached to children, but I think it's really helpful when we think about adults and it's this concept of significant harm. Children are said to have experienced um, abuse or challenge if they've experienced significant harm and that means ill treatment or impairment of health or development. Then I'm going to break that down even further. Development can be their physical development, their growth, intellectual, emotional, social or behavioural. Health is either their physical or their mental. An impairment, uh, sorry, or ill health includes the four types of abuse that we attach to children and young people which is sexual abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse, and neglect. We're going to briefly talk about those in a later section. Now, significant harm for children can be a single event. It could be a longer term campaign. And this opens up an interesting discussion of what is abuse and what is safeguarding versus what is a criminal matter. So a thought here is that somebody might have experienced a traumatic event way back in their childhood, which has really changed who they could be as an adult. It's really affected them and has had a long term legacy on their adult life. And that's a lot of the reason why I, I bring this up. Something that could have happened years ago could still be manifesting itself in their adult life. There are also things that could have happened but have been held back. There are also things that could have been um, affected in terms of the way they make social connection, friendships, the way they communicate, etc. All of those things which have impaired that person's health and development. Now, there are maybe two different sides to this, and I, I like to throw this out there for your consideration, is that is, is abuse and safeguarding about one specific event, or is it about a cultivated relationship which then has a campaign of abuse attached to it? It could be that that one significant event has come from a campaign of abuse in a cultivated relationship, or it could be a, a one-off event that has come from seemingly nowhere. The concept from the Protections of Freedoms Act and the look around DBS and screening and regulated activity, which is how they decide who is DBS or not, looks at Sort of safeguarding as a long term campaign. It's about having regular access and being able to form a relationship. But from a child perspective, it could be a one off event. And I would argue, and this is my own viewpoint, that 
a one-off event can have quite a big significant impact on an adult too. So in terms of that safeguarding, in terms of that protecting people from harm, and just in terms of our duty of care as a community organisation, as a volunteer, acknowledging this concept of a one-off, I think is equally important. One thing that attaches to children and adults is this concept of the toxic trio. Now, the toxic trio are three interlinking situations that when a child or young person finds themselves in the centre of that, it's got a very, very increased likelihood that there is some sort of harm happening to that young person. You might meet the adults that are living in that situation. Again, you might meet the adult which has been the child and has been long term affected by that. So the three parts of that are in no particular order. Domestic abuse, mental health challenges and substance misuse. All of these three things happening in a relationship or a household will create a, a perfect storm, if you like, and create a situation where somebody is likely to be harmed. As I say, you might meet the adult, you might meet the child, you might meet somebody who has lived with that situation for many years or lived with a relationship or a connection where these three things come together as a, as a red flag for you to think about that person's household, if somebody's talking to you and you can identify some of these things, it might be a consideration of, you know, are there children in the household? Is this something we maybe need to raise as a concern? Because it could well be that these three situations are preventing somebody from giving the support and the care to those children and young people that they, they need and that they're trying, but they're not able to because they're, they're caught up in these situations. The things that you might see as uh, as the adult in front of you is a concept called ACEs. It's work that there is research going into at the moment and there's discussions of it um, in various different avenues around safeguarding. ACEs stands for Adverse Childhood Experience and it's what we we're talking about before with significant harm. It's either a series of ab abuse um, or it's a, a one term traumatic event. The argument with ACEs is that it's uh, something that's been very overwhelming. It's been scary. It, it's a negative event ultimately. And what it has is a long term effect on that person. That person lives with that ACE and that has affected them and how they see themselves, how they see the world, how they say before form relationships. It has consequences and effects on their resilience. Um, there's some argument to talk about people's physicality and their physical makeup and whether past significant events can have effect on that. It's equivalent to or can be discussed around the notion of this post-traumatic stress idea, the PTSD, that it's, it's the, the long-term um, effect of a one-off situation. However, what the research also identifies is that in being uh, connected to a trusted person to support and listen to this, to have a positive relationship with an adult or a trusted person whilst that is happening can really reduce the long term effects of that. A lot of the arguments would also say that somebody who is currently an adult and is experiencing harm or abuse to have a connection to a trusted person who just listens to them and believes them 
and sees them for who they truly are and who they feel that they are and who they want to be is incredibly powerful. And this takes us back to one of the first statements that we made about what role do we play? And we play the role of that trusted person that sees them. What we are certainly not, and I'll repeat this again a few times, we are not there to solve the problem. We are there to listen and to pass on. But do know that that listening and that passing on is incredibly powerful and can really make a vast difference in someone's world. So this idea of aces and the significant harm in the toxic trio are things that could happen at any point in time, but especially during childhood, that can really affect the adult that they are. And when we look at when we looked at the care and support need, that previous experience of abuse, that's what this is all talking about. And that could be at any age. You could still see this in somebody who we would consider, you know, considerably older. You could see this in somebody in their nineties. It's not about kind of, you know, happening in the last 10 years. Depending on the event, this could stay with somebody for a long, long time. When we look at abuse as a big, broad concept, there are specific acts and situations in amongst that. There is an ever-growing list as we discover different ways, different groups of people, different situations that we need to create specific support around. But, uh, and the logos you see at the bottom of the screen, the Social Care Institute of Excellence, the Care Act and the NHS, stuff that you've got links to at the bottom of the video, attach 10 different types of abuse to adults. Within that 10, there are four that attach to children and young people. These are kind of the big collective ones. All the rest that aren't on this list um, are either very specific groups of people or very specific communities, etc. So these are the kind of nationally defined list. They are, in no particular order, physical, sexual, psychological, financial or material, organisational, neglect, self-neglect, discriminatory, domestic and modern slavery. The ones that are listed in blue on the screen are the four that we attach to children and young people. I'm going to go through this list with some brief definition in a bit. But first, we're going to talk about the signs and signifiers of abuse. If you put those 10 um, out, out on a table and look at all the signs and signifiers, there is a a kind of universal five that kind of stand out as covering most of them. We're going to talk about these five. What I do want you to note though, and please be mindful of this, is that just because somebody is displaying some of this doesn't immediately mean they're being harmed and abused. One thing to think about is that all of these situations collectively would raise the alarm bells for you or if all of a sudden somebody started to display this with no particular explanation that you can find so it's either a sudden change in somebody's behavior or seeing this all together just because somebody presents with one of these things there are other explanations for them too which does make sometimes safeguarding challenging and which is why, especially with adults, we treat it sensitively because there are some things, even with this list, that people can do to themselves through choice. So it means that we can't immediately jump to the safeguarding conclusion. So in no particular order, some signs and signifiers. 
poor concentration and a lack of focus. Now this is slightly beyond being easily distracted. Uh, this is beyond just being not particularly um, on top of the conversation we're having or just being slightly forgetful. This is being so challenged by their situation that they're struggling to uh, struggling to keep their capacity going, struggling to string a sentence together, struggling to follow a train of thought or a conversation, remember really basic tasks. It's the fact that their body and their brain and their heart are so hurt or so numbed by their situation that they're so very very distracted it's that idea that they're they're physically here but mentally and emotionally potentially somewhere else and it could be that their body's trying to protect them that their brain's trying to protect them or that it's just so taken up by everything they're experiencing that they just are struggling to concentrate A fear of outside intervention. Now, when I ask groups in, in training what who, who we think the outside could be, we usually very logically think GPs, medical personnel, the police, etc. And that's absolutely right because people are scared of those those agencies, and we said that at the start because well you could take my kids away or you could report me or you could change the situation and I'm, I'm i'm scared that that situation changes and i get hurt more or something happens to someone else but the outside could also be the people closest to them it could be um, a sibling a parent a partner a child it could be somebody that lives in their own household so the outside is essentially anybody that isn't part of that abusive or harmful relationship or connection which means that people could be experiencing something when they leave the house or when they go back home and their work colleagues don't know anything or their parents don't know anything because it happens when they leave the house or their partner doesn't know anything so that outside could be somebody very close to them that fear is based on a threat of harm more to them. It's a threat of harm to their family or their pets or their property. It's, it's often said that a lot of people who live with harm and abuse also blame themselves for their situation because something they must have did has meant that they are being punished or harmed because of that. That fear of somebody else finding out that harmful, abusive situation means that whatever it is they did will also be outed too. So there's a sort of protective cycle of, I don't want anybody to find out about the abuse because I don't want to find out whatever it is that I did or whatever it is that the perpetrator has made me believe that I've did. So the outside could be people very close, it could be professionals, and it could be for a range of reasons that people are fearful. Something that you will be able to see, something you will be able to smell and experience is poor non-existent personal care or malnutrition. Multiple reasons around this. Um, some things that these could be for personal choice. Somebody could decide um, to no longer take care of themselves or take their medication etc or the bubble they have around them that idea of those social or external factors either chooses not to care for them or doesn't have the capacity or the ability to care it can also come down to resources and the ability to access a proper diet medication um, money um, heating etc so it's something that you would witness for multiple re witness but has sorry multiple reasons behind it but attach even those three things together and suddenly you could see how we can paint a picture of somebody who's being harmed 
extreme behaviour comes in many forms, but there's probably two quite notable ones. One being extremely introverted and disconnected, not making eye contact, wearing clothes that they cover most of their skin with, kind of pulling sleeves down over hands, very closed body language, hands closed across their body, hugging themselves, etc. Hoods up, hats on, not making contact, trying to blend into the background. Monosyllabic answers, um, very brief conversation, if any, tries to reduce communication or keeps communication to maybe an electronic form and not an interpersonal form. Um, a very, very introverted behaviour says, don't look at me, don't pay attention to me in my situation. It's basically trying to sort of hide and blend in. The other side, which people don't always expect, is potentially the opposite of that. It's extremely extroverted behaviour. It's big, it's loud, it's brash, it's potentially quite happy. It can be quite self-destructive, as both of them can. Um, it can involve substances, it can involve drinking or overeating or using drugs or other substances. <clears throat> and that big behaviour is what we would consider to be part of masking. And what masking is, is disguising a situation with with a with a bravado, with a mask. And saying that, look, I'm this big, happy, extroverted person, or I'm this big, um, angry person, even. When we go back to the care and support needs list, this idea of unusual or aggressive behaviour. This idea that that's what you see and I will push you all away so you don't see my actual situation or you think they're happy, nothing could possibly be going wrong in their world or nothing could be hurting them in any way. So it's about distracting behaviour. So that behaviour can be big and extreme, it could be kind of very small and introvert. It could also just be unusual for them. If suddenly an introvert becomes hugely extrovert, again with no logical reason, or the other way around, that big sudden shift would be something that would highlight your attention. Inconsistent injury. Inconsistent with a few things. Inconsistent with their situation and their lifestyle. So knowing that, I, I often use the case, so if somebody presents to you with cauliflower ears and a bus stop nose and you know they play golf, those two things don't align. But the minute you discover they play rugby, that suddenly makes a little bit more sense. So understanding their, their life situation and understanding things that could happen to them, random breaks or chips or knocks or whatever that have very logical explanation. Could also be inconsistent with their their home situation. So how did this injury happen? Well, I fell down the stairs. Well, I know you live in a bungalow which with no stairs. What stairs did you fall down? How did this happen? It's thinking about how the story correlates one of the sort of more stereotypical attached to domestic abuse as I walked into a door for an explanation for a black eye. And that goes back many, many years. It's very hard to get a black eye from walking into a door. So it's inconsistent with the explanation and that person's situation. It could also be inconsistent with actually how most injury happens. So we all have some sort of pointy bit or something that sticks out regardless of our situation. Whoever it is we are, we've got a bit that inevitably is likely to get knocked or bumped or bruised by a door handle or the corner of a table or whatever that might be. It's very hard to get bruising round, let's say, a collarbone or 
unless you do specific sports or you use specific assistive equipment on your inner thighs. So inconsistent with just standard accidental injury without good explanation. Now, certainly with injury and with maybe some of these other things, it's hard to witness that. Because, again, how, how would you know if somebody had bruised collarbones or big bruises down their back? Most of our volunteering doesn't mean that we see people in states of undress. What we might see, however, is the physical effect of that. If you imagine that through um, either poor personal care or sexual abuse, somebody's groin or genital area is very painful you would see that as they stand up and sit down there's only so much you can hide a wince especially if you live living with quite extreme pain you may have bruising on your shoulders or your collarbones or your back from physical or sexual abuse and you would potentially witness that as someone puts their coat on and off as the action of raising their arm to twist their shoulder into the sleeve creates that wince and that pain so you might see the physical manifestation of that as opposed to actually the signs of that couple that physical manifestation to some of these changes or just that person's general demeanor if they display a lot of this if you've not if you've only just met them etc then that could that should start raising the flags ringing the bells however you want to term it, it should start raising your concern that you might just need to highlight this to somebody. So as I say, all these things individually are not necessarily indicators, but package them together and they could create a bigger picture that somebody is potentially being harmed. We're now going to look at the 10 types of abuse i'm going to give you a quite a generic broad definition of it certainly if you know something might affect you or trigger you absolutely practice self-care either take a moment to reflect afterwards or if you want to skip through this you can do read about it in your own leisure the other thing to think about here is the type of people that you volunteer with, the type of organisation you're connected to and the work that you do. And talk to your volunteer manager about what are the, the likely types of abuse that people might experience. So if you work with older people, for example, then older people are more likely to experience financial or material abuse than younger people are. People with learning difficulties, the same more likely to experience that financial or material abuse. So have a talk to your volunteer manager, see if there are some things that you might want to swap up on a little bit more, learn a bit more about and what things you might just need a, a general awareness of. Links are below to the organisations that the logos are on screen, the Social Care Institute of Excellence, the Care Act and the NHS. You'll be able to read more about this uh, at your own leisure. But I just wanted to give you a very brief overview of what the 10 mean. So physical abuse can be defined as using a weapon, a body or an environment to cause harm to a person. Sexual abuse is non-consensual acts or sexual behaviour. Psychological abuse, we would have maybe historically known as verbal or emotional, has now been packaged together into psychological abuse. Is control or harm caused by behaviour or acts or messages. Financial or material is the exploitation or misuse of a person's assets.
organisational abuse, which used to be called institutional abuse, is the poor treatment and dehumanisation by an organisation. Neglect is the removal or denial of basic and additional life needs, and that's usually by another person. Self-neglect by the individual themselves is the inability or unwillingness to exercise self-care. Discriminatory, which is the other half of what used to be institutional abuse, is harassment and deliberate exclusion based on a perceived difference. Domestic abuse is coercion and control within an intimate or close relationship. Modern slavery has many different elements to it, but for the purposes of this, we package human trafficking, forced labour, sexual exploitation, debt bondage, organ harvesting and criminal exploitation under that banner. These can all be expanded considerably and what takes into account this type of abuse can be discussed in many different ways depending on who you work with. One thing to note here is that there's a slight difference between act and behaviour. Act is much more direct and behaviour is much more um, cultural and interpersonal. So, f as an example, um, a sexual act would be direct physical contact. A sexual behaviour might be catcalling, unwanted innuendo, unwanted sexual conversation. Um, so the difference is the difference in contact, but can equally be as harmful when somebody experiences that behaviour towards them. I'm not going to go into any deeper um, here, partly because I can't see you and I don't know what's going to affect or trigger anybody. And I also, there's so many different types of volunteer going to watch this. So I'm going to let you do your own research, talk to your volunteer manager. If you want any more information or support, by all means contact the WVA team and we will help you find what you need. I'm going to move on to a slightly different concept now. One of the things that has been highlighted through some big high profile cases, um, some cases that were big that never were never highlighted, but also some day-to-day -day interactions is that the people involved in safeguarding from our side, the carer side, are super crucial and very key to the case really being um, not solved, but at least dealt with properly. There have been so many people historically who have dismissed cases for multiple different reasons. And one of the things the Care Act does is it highlights and encourages us to think about that. And I think it's a worthwhile discussion. We talk about the idea of personal values and that the friendship groups we make, the connections we make, the people we gravitate towards, tend to have similar values. We tend to have similar moral systems. We tend to think things are right. The same things are right and wrong. We like the same music. We like the same leisure stuff. It's what makes us friends and connected. What it means is that we we squad together and we make we make an us. We are a group of us and we are all together and we believe the same, the same things. However, in having an us, what it means is that somewhere over there is a them. And 
we don't always like them because they're different and they have different values and different things. And sometimes it's when we're confronted with them that the antagonistic situation arises or if a them comes and presents to you, how you react to that can potentially change the entire future of the case. What it says is that we need to consider that person's individual journey. You will know yourself. You are, an, you are a lived experience collection of everything that's happened to you from birth until now. And I can't tell you what you've been through. And I can't tell you how that's affected you. However, many cases historically have been thwarted by people bringing their individual journey and somebody who was supposed to be trusted saying, oh, well, that would happen to somebody like you, or, well, obviously, if you live there, that's going to happen. Or, well, if you didn't do that, then this wouldn't happen to you. It's also the idea that, well, that doesn't happen here. That wouldn't happen in Warrington. If we've never lived it or experienced it, sometimes it's hard to believe that it happens elsewhere. And what it's sometimes quite easy to do is dismiss somebody's journey because we just simply find it so outlandish or fantastical or scary that that could happen to somebody that we're, we're sitting in front of. So we are a collection of opportunities and experiences. And what that says is that if somebody says something to you, believe it. It's not your position as a volunteer to unpack that, to investigate that, to dismiss that. It's your role to pass that information on and let somebody who is trained, covered, insured, experienced in unpacking that to do that. That's never ever going to be a volunteer role at the moment to do that level of investigation. So if that individual journey arrives at you, regardless of whether it presses your buttons or affects your personal values, take it for what it is and make sure it gets passed on. Because we exercise social judgment, we compare our own version of the truth to other people and we compare our own value system to that experience and it suddenly changes our perception of other people. What we're trying to ultimately achieve here is what I was saying before about being friendly and not a friend, this objective distance. We're trying to treat people equitably in terms of what, who are you and what do you need rather than treating everybody with the same blanket treatment or judgment. It's how you split your own value and indeed your reactions. Think about, honestly think about who you are and how you react. You can't see me because you can only hear my voice, obviously, but I have what I call my judgmental eyebrow. My left eyebrow raises when something happens that I'm not sure about or I don't believe. And sometimes I've had to have a word with that eyebrow because it's happened at times when I think oh lord I look like I'm judging you and I'm really trying not to um, but it just it my values are being pressed and there's nothing wrong with having those values there's nothing wrong with having your personal beliefs it's how you can use that interaction and how you form that connection that's the, the mark of it all so think about your objective distance, how you can maintain a professional supportive front, because suddenly it's, it's actually not about you, it's about them and that moment. So it's how you make that about them. Now that's sometimes a really tough journey, but it's a super important one because so many people have never had their voices heard because the person they chose to raise their voice to turned it to being all about them and dismissed the voice. One of the things that I would absolutely always encourage you to do, and 
I realise this slightly contradicts what I've just said. <laughs> this is absolutely all about you. This is about you and your protection. So yes, whilst you're dealing with all of this, it's about them and their experience. On your day-to-day -day operation, on the times when you're just doing what you do as part of your volunteering role, make sure that you're protected. Make sure that you understand what is safe, what you are allowed to do, what is within your boundaries, what is out with your boundaries and what should you not be doing. And understand where your volunteering role ends and potentially where a staff role begins or where your volunteering role ends because there's potential harm to either party if you did that thing. So I like to think of it as an ABC and the A stands for activities. So think about what you're being asked to do. What is your role? Does it feel safe or do you feel comfortable doing it? Because for whatever reason, based on your individual journey, you might not feel safe doing it. It might be something that kind of triggers you a bit. It might be something that makes you feel a bit uncomfortable. It, you might not feel particularly comfortable working with a specific service user or client. It might just, it might just not work. So think about the activities, think about the time, the place. Are you being asked to go somewhere on your own in the dark? Does that feel safe and comfy to you? If you're okay with that, great. Or if you are being asked to go somewhere on your own in the dark, what protective measures need to happen? Do you need a torch? Do you need a phone number? Do you need somebody on call? Do you need to make sure you phone them somebody before and after? Do you understand where, where and how to park your car to make a quick exit, etc, etc. Think about the activities and absolutely challenge your volunteer manager with anything that you don't think is safe. Challenge your volunteer manager with anything that you think is going to cause harm to you or to the service user. Situations that you think this is a really terrible plan because X, Y and Z could happen. Think about that risk assessment all the time. Think about the th things that we just do because we're trying to help and we find ourselves in unsafe situations and we go, oh, well, it's all right though, because, you know, they need that support or, you know, I'm just a volunteer. You're not just a volunteer. You are a person making a huge impact to our community and you need to be safe and supported doing it. So always make sure you're protected. Think about your boundaries that you've been given. As I say, where do they link to another service? Where do they link to somebody else in your organization? How far can I go? What can I do? They're there for a reason. Find out why they exist if you don't understand. If you've been told not to give out your phone number to somebody and you don't quite understand why and you don't quite see the reason as to why, then ask. Ask as many questions as it takes for you to understand these boundaries. One of the things that volunteer managers are very guilty of and people that run organisations in general we live this world all the time. This is who we are and this is what we do. And we've had to justify everything and anything. And to a certain degree as well, you know, we're trying our best um, and we don't always get everything right. But sometimes we'll put, we'll make a rule or we'll create a system and we'll tell everybody that rule and completely neglect to tell you why. We'll say, don't give out your phone number. We'll never quite explain why, but you'll think, oh, well, that, no, that's fine. I'll just give them it anyway. And suddenly all these situations come out of that. And it's because we've not explained. So seek explanation, ask until you fully understand. And if there's a rule that you want to challenge, by all means do so. 
please be aware and have a think that if you have challenged a rule, however, and the volunteer manager comes back and says, look, if you are going to do all of this, we can't have you volunteer. Understand that too and take that kind of hit because not everybody likes you know not everybody finds those rules comfortable if you want to go and do all those things and break those boundaries etc know that that's your choice but also know that you could harm yourself and other people doing it these things are here for a reason we've not just kind of made these situations up just because we like the power and control they're there either because best practice has dictated this or bitter experience has dictated this or years and years of learning has said we know just don't do that so consider boundaries in that situation c stands for conduct if you're unsure ask what kind of behavior is acceptable and this is on both sides of service user and volunteer. You know, there might be language that you're willing to tolerate from a service user. There might also be language or attitudes you're not willing to tolerate from a service user. And again, they could press your personal values. They could press your buttons and just make you deeply uncomfortable. So their conduct might not match with what you expect and what you um what you find appropriate equally consider how the activities and the boundaries placed on you can affect your conduct think about the language it might make you use or not use think about the the topics of conversation think about the the things that you might oh we'll just sneaky break that boundary we'll just break that rule nobody will ever find out it's considering how you behave how you conduct yourself doing your volunteering is it safe for you is it safe for everybody else what you also are is not rep not just representing yourself you're representing the organization too and so much of safeguarding and um, a lot of self-protective practices are based on somebody else's perception if you, for example, become super friendly with one service user, but dislike another service user and ignore them, how does that look to other people looking in? If you hug one service user, but not anybody else, how does that look to somebody else looking in? So consider conduct in terms of physical contact, in terms of time and attention. Think of just the way that you behave in your volunteering and how that might be perceived because over friendly or conduct that makes a, a stronger connection might be perceived not in the way you intended to that service user a lot of the boundaries and a lot of this conduct is raised because the people that we work with usually by definition are living with some sort of challenges some point some sort of care and support need which makes them vulnerable and open to harm they're looking for a meaningful connection they're looking for somebody to to believe in them and accept them and if you're the person that gives them that there's a potential connection that they could make there that you weren't really intending on they might suddenly think you're friends when you're just attempting to be friendly so think about what you give away of yourself think about what information you give you might want to share that you've got kids but they don't need to know their names and ages you could just talk about your your child or my daughter or my son you don't need to go any further than that they certainly don't need to know what school they go to or you know what hobbies they have etc just consider how much you give away and what that perception is of the person you're talking to but also the perception of the other people around them ultimately protect yourself and keep that bubble strong we're now heading into the last section which is about reporting and how you deal with what we call a safeguarding concern now a safeguarding concern is probably the 
the new term, if you like, for disclosure or accusation, because what it means is that we're concerned about a situation. Nothing's been proven yet, so we're not necessarily disclosing a situation. We're not necessarily accusing anybody of anything. What we're doing is we're just raising a concern about a circumstance or a situation. So the way they might, the way this concern might get to you is you might see the physical signs. Again, we'll talk back to those signs and signifiers. You might see those things that might happen really suddenly or you might watch a decline. You might see behavioural changes and behavioural signs, again, in a quite quick change or watch that behaviour um, alter over some time, especially if you see somebody on a very regular basis. You might be aware of people and their lives and how they deal with certain situations or times of year. Some people don't do winter very well. Some people really dislike Christmas. Some people dislike the summer. Some people have specific times of year or anniversaries of people's passing, etc., that they are affected by and the you know that that's going to change their behavior if you've got that kind of understanding and um rationale behind that change then you know what to do with that however if that happens at a completely different time of the year or they really decline over winter and still don't pick up by spring when they normally would it's a thought of what's what's happened there this time that's made it different what what's changed in their world that might have raised the situation somebody shares something they've seen or heard the more that people are aware of the different types of abuse different ways that safeguarding can be seen the more that people are speaking up about their peers or people that they are connected to so somebody might bring something to you about someone else and somebody might come to you or somebody may just start the conversation with you as a trusted person about something that's happening to them it's usually at a point where it's most convenient for them and at a time where they're feeling safe and comfortable and often distracted by a task so either doing some craft or dishes or whatever something where one part of their brain is occupied and it's allowing them a comfortable space where they can start to share something that's happening it's about just being present and allowing that to happen and finding a way for you to keep that going without making a big deal that everybody needs to stop and listen because here is this one person sharing their truth and they don't necessarily want an audience because they've chosen to tell you but let's talk about that in the next section so when a concern comes your way when somebody starts to share something that's happened to them or something about somebody else we now have a system that we follow you might be panicking adrenaline is a fantastic chemical and it will pump through your body but it will be priming you to do everything you need to do it will be very easy to suddenly start to panic but take a deep breath try and remember some of these words and believe me you will just do it you might panic and fall apart later but at the time amazingly you just do what you need to do so trust in yourself that you will be doing what what you should be doing at this point in time so in responding to a concern we've got some you musts and we have some you must nots so as part of the you must if that person presents injured or the perpetrator is close by or it's just happened call the police and if need be an ambulance if they're wearing any evidence try and preserve it as much as you can don't wash them down unless that injury is very very severe 
don't try and treat it try and preserve it and make them comfortable but allow it to be photographed properly by the police or medical personnel allow it to be documented in a way that can help the case try and not to compromise any evidence at all so if that person presents and something has just happened or somebody's nearby and call the police and the ambulance if somebody's in immediate danger you might not think you're listening carefully but as i say adrenaline phenomenal thing it will help you out try and listen carefully because at some point in time you're going to have to report to somebody else what you've been told so listen as clearly and carefully as you can you might need to reassure that person and say to them that they've did the right thing they might suddenly start to regret what they've told you or really feel that they're to blame it's that time where you just need to give them that bit of reassurance where you need to be that trusted person and say it's okay that you can tell me this i believe you i see you i hear you those things are maybe not something anybody has ever kind of said to them for a long time or something that they feel just doesn't exist in the world it's somebody that believes them don't deal with this on your own partly so you can get some wider support but also the organization needs to know that a safeguarding concern is being dealt with internally so tell your volunteer manager your safeguarding lead whatever your internal process is make sure you follow that all of this is purely suggestion so go with exactly what your organization has and if you need some wider support or you need to follow their protocol that's what you do this is all just a, a suggestive protocol based on good practice so tell your manager so they can support you because you've just dealt with quite a, a challenging situation and also so they know that they have a safeguarding they've dealt with a safeguarding situation internally because there's some you must there's always some you must not on the other side every boundary has another side to it don't touch or clear away the evidence big part of it as i said before you can compromise a case it's very tempting to try and mop somebody up or clean them up or you know try and even photograph things yourself and things like that don't do any of that at all you're not mandated supported covered to do any of that stuff so don't do it don't get yourself involved in the situation don't get yourself in, into trouble by compromising a case don't get your torches and pitchforks and form an angry mob and try and find the perpetrator it's not your role to try and solve this it's not your role to try and bring that person justice it's your role to pass on that information keep the objective distance as much as you can they might ask you to keep this a secret you can't ever do that you're going to have to tell somebody you're going to have to tell them now that you've told me i've got to tell somebody else i always had i had a trainer many many jobs ago that said if you keep it a secret you're as bad as the perpetrator i think well ultimately what he meant by that is that you're you're giving the situation permission you're saying that's okay that that happened to you and i'm going to keep that a secret too but also think about what that does to you that gets you involved in that situation that means that you know that's happening and you're you're okay with that because you're part of that secret so don't keep it a secret it's not good for either side try and let them talk try and be conscious of what kind of listener you are it goes back to the personal perspective idea but if you're a mm -hmm, aha then what oh yeah oh that must have been terrible try and just squash that down try and not do that 
let them talk. You need to listen because you need to remember everything they're saying if you're not able to jot it down as they're talking. Try and think about the questions they are, the questions you ask them. <laughs> Try and ultimately not ask them anything. But if you feel that there's more that they need to say, don't do and then what? Give them space to talk, say, I'm here to listen. You can keep talking if you want. Or, you know, this is your time. I'm here for you. Do it through reassurance. You know, don't worry, don't worry about, you know, don't worry about the time. It's fine. You keep talking. Do it from a reassuring perspective as opposed to, and then what happened? Because sometimes that person has chosen you, well, a lot of the time that person's chosen you because they trust you. They, they know or really feel that you're going to do something about it and they, they, they want to please you. And if you say, and then what happened and they've got nothing else, they think, oh, now, now they want something else. So they either elaborate on something, means the whole thing goes down a different route or they they suddenly clam up because they think they've let you down so try and not ask questions also try and not use words that they've not used so if you do really feel that you need to ask a question or if you maybe need a bit of clarity use the words they've asked, they've used it might be a word you don't like, it might be a word you feel uncomfortable with, but you might have to use that word for the moment. If we think about saying, and, and did they assault you again? If the person sharing has never said the word assault, and you've had to use assault to make sense in your head, assault might either really overblow that situation or completely underplay that situation. So suddenly using that word, and they start using that word might completely blow the whole case. So think about the, the language that you use as you talk to people. This information is confidential. Everything they've told you goes to the appropriate parties and the appropriate parties are the safeguarding team, the police or your safeguarding lead. This doesn't go anywhere else. If you need to talk about this, if you've been affected by the situation, talk to your volunteer manager and they will find some support for you. Do not go home, talk to your family about it. Don't bring it up at team meetings. Don't talk to other volunteers. This is that person's life and their situation and they deserve and are entitled to their confidentiality and to that respect. So don't take that story elsewhere, keep that information to the specific legitimate need to know people. As you go through, there might be a lot of information being put your direction. You may want to record this information, you may want to jot things down and that could be simply a case of saying, I don't want to forget anything you've said because it is very important and I really care about this. So I'm just going to make some notes because I need to tell somebody about what you've told me. Now, underneath the video, there is a template recording form. <clears throat> you can choose to use that in your organisation or your organisation might already have one. But have something, be it paper specifically for that or a recording form around and about so you can grab it and start making some notes. If not, find paper and pen as quickly as possible. Don't type things into your phone. Don't record anything verbally. Don't record it electronically because that's your own personal phone and you're then, or even if it's an organization phone, you're then putting that evidence onto something that somebody either then has to take away, which could have other confidential information on it, or it's you putting your personal situation 
into that person's personal situation and you're getting yourself involved in a way you don't need to. Always do it on a separate sheet of paper. Don't have a recording book because that book then actually could be entirely taken away and be involved in this case. And then there's lots of other people's confidential information in that book as well. So it's always separate sheets of paper. Easier said than done, but again, you will, your body serves you well. Try and stay calm, try not to show any strong emotion. If you fall apart and they're needing you to just for this moment, listen and action it, and you're crumbling on the floor, then nothing gets done. So please try, with all frivolousness aside, please try and stay as calm and focused as you can. You can, you can look after you later and there's lots of ways that you can be supported afterwards. Time stands still and this is all about that person. You're there to listen and reassure them that that's the case. They can take all the time they need and that they're allowed to talk and un unload what's happening. Use that time to write down what they're saying. The reason you're doing it at the time is so you don't forget it. Your brain reorganises it to make sense to you later on and it's just making sure that the proper account gets to where it needs to be. Put the time and date on that because it's important. It could well be that it's, sorry, it's an important time or date that they've chosen to share that information. Um, it's also the time and date that you've been told that because it might just be for some reason different to the time and date that you report to. So the listening to the concern and the reporting of the concern might have a gap between them. Make sure everything is factual and accurate. Don't paraphrase, don't shuffle things around. Use their own words. Even if those words are uncomfortable to you, even if those words are not a word you would like to say, if they have said a vulgar word for a body part or a situation, write it in full. Don't um, don't put asterisks where the vowels should be. Don't um, adapt it in any way. Put it down exactly as they've said. This could make or break a case. Factual and accurate and using their own words is a big, big part of this because sometimes there's coding used. Sometimes there's words that you would not expect somebody of that age to understand and use contextually. So these things are very important. If it feels relevant, describe the circumstances or anybody else that might have been around at the time. Um, it could well be important to the case. It could also be that another volunteer might be hearing a bit of what you're hearing too, and they might take something different from it. So if it's relevant, stick that information in. Use a body map to record the injuries. I've tried to find a gender neutral body map and you'll see if you look at the template, it's still male, but it's it's as neutral as I could find it. What you record doesn't have to be Grey's Anatomy. It doesn't have to be beautifully illustrated. It's really just an arrow and an X or a circle or whatever. Again, use their words. You don't have to see it. Take their word for it. If they say if they have a big bruise on their bottom or a big bruise on their back, don't ask them to lift their top or drop their trousers. Think about kind of their their dignity and the situation. And also just believe them. Listen and respect to their individual journey. Don't photograph it. Again, do you should you really have a picture of somebody's bottom on your phone? Even if it's with the best intention, think about what that means to the outside world. So use a body map, just use some pointed arrows. Um, whatever, try and get them to describe it the best they can and that's fine. Complete sign and data, that again could be different to the concern, so make sure that the you've dated that report as to when you filled it out as opposed to when you listened. There's a location, again, 
could be relevant. So the time and the date of the concern, we were in this space. I then wrote the report in that space, or if they all happen to be the same thing, write the same thing. Once you've gathered all of this information, it will go, depending on your internal organization's protocol, to a few different places. Warrington Borough Council has created what they call the first response team, which is a combination of safeguarding professionals who are there for several different reasons, but the main two are to deal with safeguarding concerns, and you will do that by phoning the main council switchboard, which is 01925443322. You select option two for social care and the system guides you from there. They will take safeguarding concerns, so the report that you've just heard, etc., etc., they will deal with that situation. They will take that person's information and what you've heard, and they will action it from there. You can then rest assured that somebody will deal with it in an appropriate fashion, and you have fulfilled your role protecting and supporting the community by passing that information on. The other thing that the first response team are there for and do very well is information, advice and guidance. You might have something as a team, as an organisation, as a volunteer, that you think that doesn't feel right, that makes, that feels uncomfortable, I feel that this person might be being harmed. You can phone them for advice and information. You can talk to them about the situation, how you're connected to it, what's happening, what you've seen, and they will give you advice on how to handle that situation. So you're not you're not alone in this safeguarding world. It's not up to you to decide everything. You've got support out there. And the first response team, which is, sits within the council, is part of that. If somebody isn't, from Warrington, you happen to know they're not from Warrington, or you feel more comfortable doing so, you can get the same information and do the same thing through the police. You can contact 101, raise a safeguarding concern. They will again put the correct action in place. But again, you can contact 101 and seek that safeguarding support as well if you have questions about what to do about a person's specific circumstance. There is an out-of-office number, a Warrington number, which is 652222. And you all know this, hopefully, but if there is an emergency, you're bypassing all of this and you're phoning 999. And you're asking for immediate support from some sort of emergency service. Response and reporting will vary according to organisation and organisation system and protocol, but do, do make sure you understand what your organisation requires of you. It could well be that your organisation has somebody that will listen to the concern. It could well be that you are the only person that ever sees that service user and you have to listen to the concern. You need to know what they expect of you in terms of safeguarding. So make sure you understand what they mean. Because ultimately one thing that we would always say is that doing nothing is never an option. Always ask the question, if you have any sort of niggling concern or something that you just doesn't feel is right, ask your volunteer manager, talk to them about it. They might have some background information that you don't need to know and that they can reassure you that it's being dealt with or they can start a plan as to working out what we're all going to do about it. One of those plans could be calling the police or phoning the first response team to ask for further support. But do think that you could change somebody's life here. Don't sit on something and think, oh, that doesn't happen here, or that's that's not anything that would ever happen, or well, obviously it's going to happen to that person. Don't sit back and give it permission. Raise your voice, exercise your duty of care, 
do what you started volunteering for, which is to make a difference and change some lives. It's better to be told, thank you very much, we'll keep an eye on it, than let that go and allow somebody to be harmed or worse. Remember, at all times, data protection is is entirely outweighed by safeguarding. So if you need to tell the police or your safeguarding lead or the first response team somebody's details, better that you have to explain how their details got to the police than explain how they were horribly harmed by the situation that they were in. So share information, ask the questions, be curious, do wonder about people's change in behaviour in their circumstances etc and if you need any more support or any information do always remember you can contact the WVA team. I thank you very much for listening I hope you found this informative and interesting do check out the links below the video and stay curious stay safe Look after yourself and other people. Thank you very much for listening.